Another heated exchange today on the contentious Fair Elections Act. The clock is counting down for a committee that is racing through these. Check this out, folks. This is 275 proposed amendments in just three days. Now, some of them are doubled up, but there's a lot of them here. We've marked it up for you to check out. Just over an hour from now, MPs on the Procedure and House Affairs Committee will begin its clause-by-clause -clause review of the controversial bill. I'm sure our own Katie O'Malley will be there to watch over it. You can follow her blog on that. But they have until Thursday to plow through all this. So after the government agreed to make a few concessions on Friday, how many more changes is it prepared to make, if any? What are the key amendments the opposition parties are pushing for now? Joining me now in the foyer of the House of Commons, Aaron O'Toole, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. David Christofferson is the Deputy Leader of the NDP. Scott Sims is the Liberal Democratic Reform Critic. And Elizabeth May is the leader of the Green Party. So here's what we'll do today, if you don't mind. What I'll do is I'll get the opposition on that, and then Mr. O'Toole can do a catch-all answer. So why don't I start at one end, and we'll go around. Uh, Elizabeth May, there's a, you know, the clock is ticking on this. What are your fundamental concerns coming in here? Well, I've tabled, well, actually, I've presented 84 amendments, which are deemed presented. I'm in a funny position as a non-member of the committee, but required by the conservative rules to present my amendments now as opposed to later at report stage. So my fundamental concerns, number one, I'm glad to see con some concessions, but we still don't have the kind of voting system we'll that will ensure every Canadian can and will vote. We've maintained vouching, but this time towards addresses, but we still don't have the kind of powers of subpoena and investigation that the chief elections officer should have. I think we need to make changes that go beyond the scope of the first view of Fair Elections Act to make elections really fair. We ought to be investigating proportional representation. We ought to take into account, as Democracy Watch recommended, that Elections Act should supervise the leaders' debates, and then down to a lot of specifics that the chief electoral officer should have powers to, to decline a request for an interpretive statement or guideline, that the chief elector of elections officer should be able to seek out other information and rely on that, informing so his still opinions. there's a lot. Now, now there's you a lot. Know, you know, you know it's a majority just... government, so you're going to get some, but not all of it. Let me just stick with you very, real quick. The government dropped the so-called $20 loophole fundraising provision. Just from your point of view as a small party, does that level the playing field for a small party like yours? Uh, well, the, it, to level the playing field, you would resurrect the per vote subsidy, which was the one way that Canadians knew that when they voted, their vote counted for something. In, an, in a perverse system like first past the post, that was the one way that every voter knew, even if they were sort of in a safe liberal riding or a safe conservative riding, their vote meant something to the party of their choice if $2 a year went to that party because of how they voted. That was the most democratic part of party funding. It's the one part that was removed. Yes, getting rid of the fundraising loophole and say that that's exempt from campaign spending is, a, is, is, is an improvement. But I also very supportive of Brent Rathgaber. I want to mention that independent Brent Rathgaber had an amendment before a committee this morning that was defeated that would have leveled the playing field where independents are running and not able to collect campaign contributions in the same way that members of parliament, that candidates representing any of our parties sitting here today we all have an advantage as right. part of established parties that independents don't have, and that's a very unfair playing field. All right, let me move over to Mr. Sims. Um, Mr. Sims, there's a lot. There's a, I know there's a long list. Give me the red line in your what? What do you? What amendment could you get now that would make this acceptable to you? What would be the critical amendment? Well, I think one of the, the critical amendment right now that we're looking at, of course, is the, uh, as Elizabeth pointed out, about the uh, testimony, being able to apply to a judge to get testimony in any ongoing investigations. Uh, it, what I find ironic about this is that the Conservatives seem to be so intent on finding the wrongdoers or exploiting, you know, they don't want fraud in the system to the point that they were over excessive and decided to eliminate vouching altogether. Not only that, and the other part of it is they eliminated the voter information cards, which I think in the next election is going to be a major problem that's going to come back and bite them when people realize they can't use that card that you get from Elections Canada in an election to identify where it is you live. But back to the uh, compulsion testimony, I, I, I think that there are, to, to be fair, I mean, the voter identification card or information card, you're right, uh, it hasn't always been the only way right. to be able to present your identity. There are, Mr. Paul Everett does say, there are 39 other, and some of them do have their address on it. Some, but very few. And that's one of the most disingenuous parts of this, is that they keep saying close to 40 pieces of ID. Very few of them have the addresses. For instance, here's something. Move in the now. next election, I cannot vote. 
so far because I have a post office box on my driver's license. Oh, Mr. Sims, I, be, I be, don't be disingenuous. I'm sure code. you have other forms of identification. But here's what I have to do. I have to now, because I get my bills electronically and I live in a very rural area, I now have to go to the power utility, pay the $2, and get my bill in the mail in order for me to vote unless I get That's someone not. to go with me and to vouch. Read the amendments. All yeah. right. Uh, hang yeah. on. Okay. Let, Fair Mr. Point. Mr. <laughs> Christofferson. Um, you know, obviously, you've been involved in some of the critique here. Uh, what do you think needs to happen as this, pro this process is going very fast, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what do you think is going on, and what do you think needs to happen now? Uh, well, we'd still like a rewrite. That was why my leader asked the question in the House. I mean, we have a problem right from the get-go. You know that. Uh, we predicted this would happen, that the government would feel so much pressure that on a couple of the, high, the most high-profile issues, they would be seen to make some moves, and then the country would go, oh, well, you know, it's not as bad as we thought. And yet, there's a whole lot of things that continue to be a problem, and they haven't necessarily been priority items, or they're priority items, and they've only been met halfway. For example, one of the key things we focused on was the ability to chief, chief electoral officer to promote among Canadians uh, their desire to vote. And the government eliminated that completely, but then they came out and modified it, and their amendment basically said that he can now uh, uh, encourage elementary children to vote and high school students to vote, but still can't talk to the general population. So there are still all kinds of problems, Evan. It's just no way that any of us can deal with this on a, on a panel like this, and that's why we've said the thing needs to start all over. Start over with, with uh, consultations with the appropriate experts. Barring that, we're doing the best we can fighting against the, amend the, uh, the clauses and amendments that we don't like and promoting our own, but at the end of the day, this bill, uh, as it's currently in process, is not going to to get the support of the official opposition, nor I doubt any of the other official uh, or the other opposition well, parties. It doesn't have legitimacy, Evan. Okay, M Mr. Twill, there's a, there seems to be, despite the amendments that the government's agreed to, there seems to be a pretty long list of further requests from the opposition and as they make their way through. So before I get at if you'll make any more, why rush this? I, they see, the debate's hot. There's a lot of questions. I'm looking at this. You know, I, I'm not, I, I'm not putting myself as the standard for anything. But I'll tell you, I'm trying to get make my way through. That's a lot of work to get through in a couple of days. <laughs> Why not expand the process a bit and let people have a little time to to go over 200 odd amendments? Well, mm -hmm. listen, listen, Evan. Uh, there's a lot of papers in your hand, but there's really 14 substantial amendments that the committee brought forward that the minister already suggested last week they'd support. Um, so it's consequential amendments in relation to the oath for, ad, oath for address, that sort of thing. But you got to remember, there's been almost 70 hours, or 70 witnesses, and almost 30 hours at committee, and there have been substantial amendments uh, that we're going to support. In fact, several times on your program, Evan, I suggested that that's what the committee stage was for, and we were prepared to make amendments within the spirit of the bill. And, you know, you hear my friends in the opposition, rather than commenting on that, and Weeks ago, they claimed hundreds of thousands of people would be disenfranchised, which was never true. But we've addressed the address issue clearly by allowing for the, the oath of address to be administered. So what Mr. Sims said about his not voting is actually incorrect. He should, he should check it a little bit better with any form of identification. If the postal code, which would be on his, his other form of ID, is insufficient, he can administer an oath. So there will be zero people that show up on election day that won't be able to vote. And we, we listened Trill, and made but, some changes. Not, but you, you understand, part of the logic of what you're saying is, we had a lot of testimony, we listened to it, and the bill that the minister described as terrific, obviously wasn't so terrific, and you've made some, he accepted a lot of amendments. So clearly, the time it takes to analyze this has led to improvements. Why not then continue to give it more time, as many people have asked, mm -hmm. maybe you can improve it even further. Well, listen, I think the, the amendments that are being proposed will make it a stronger bill. Canadians clearly, in a poll showed this last week, even NDP supporters support the concept of somebody showing identification oh, before they vote. One item out of the whole and thing. That's what Canadians say. And now we have a situation where we've addressed the ambiguity for the address. 
Some of the 39 forms did not have an address. We've taken care of that aspect of the bill. We've addressed some of the others, Evan. And I think now the... What about the, the, the compelling the testimony? Yeah, okay. I mean, I understand that. But, you know, part of the strategy, some have accused the government, you know, you ask for the stars, but you really just want the moon, and you get the moon. But what about one that all of them seem to agree on, including the CEO of Elections Canada, the ability to compel testimony so people come forward and they actually have to give answers in the event that there's a controversy in an election. Would, you, would your government consider that? No, no, Evan. If you look at the way our system works, and the opposition are comparing it to some, some other agencies and things where there are not criminal sanctions atta attached to some of the, the things that may be prosecuted. In the case where criminal sanctions can attach, investigations are done in the same way they're done with, with the police, which is an evidentiary base is made for charges. The commissioner will now be based out of the director of public prosecution, so the investigation Another prosecution will take place there. And you know what, Evan, the bill also contains, which they don't add, two new offenses for obstructing an investigation or for providing false information. So the commissioner will be equipped with tools to actually address people that stymie uh, investigations, but there will have to be an evidentiary burden before people, uh, uh, you know, are, are charged and prosecuted, and there's criminal uh, sanctions. I've got a minute left. I can see the other three MPs want to jump no. in. If we could do a real quick, Mr. Christofferson, well, just, me. just for an example, I mean, they talk like, oh, they, oh, we saw a problem. We didn't know it was there. Okay, we fixed the problem. There we go. Everything's just fine. Look, the fact of the matter is that that power exists in uh, seven other provinces in Canada and in quite a number of other G7 countries. It's a good proposal. Where there aren't criminal this sanctions. Is, oh, here we go again. I mean, it's always detail, little nitpicking here and there. The fact <laughs> remains. Details are important. Well, no, but the fact remains that that's where you want to focus on. Why don't you talk about the rest of the bill? Evan, Why don't you give us the time where we have and listened. give Canadians an opportunity? You've shut out Canadians. You've shut out everybody that doesn't and, have a conservative the membership Look, card. The reality is that Canadians expected to see in any fair elections act is that something like the robocall fraud of 2011 couldn't happen again. This bill leaves the door open for that to happen and again. There's a, there's and a registry now in change. place for calls it's in place and charges for calls related that are made to that. Legitimately. So and if you make my the calls illegitimately, you're not caught. constantly omit the fact that the, the bill does a lot to modernize our elections. And we've listened on the key points, made substantial they, amendments, and now, they, frankly, they look over here, don't look over here. They're grasping, Evan. Oh. All right, all right, well, how about this? The clock is ticking, but we are watching, and I look forward to more discussion tomorrow. Aaron O'Toole, David Christopherson, Scott Sims. I think Elizabeth May's gotta run back into the House as well right now, so we'll let all the MPs go. I appreciate your time, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.